Hi, this is Guy Wallace with another video in my series, Adventures in Performance-Based Training and Development, with your host, me, Guy Wallace. I've also subtitled this series, The Insomnia Solution, but not for my insomnia, but for yours. Just kidding. This video is going to cover models and methods of impact, and in particular, project plans and planning. The project plan is something that uh, is near and dear to my heart because I truly believe in doing detailed project planning. And I've gotten a lot of resistance from people, clients, uh, stakeholders of projects, um, staff, about uh, the need for detailed project planning. Now, I, when I was at Motorola, I'd been change ordered to death by a couple of consultant groups, and I vowed that when I became a consultant that I would not do change orders. And in order to make sure that we were all crystal clear on what the project was, I wanted to do detailed project planning to lay out everything, and then I would attach a fixed fee to that. And of course, that meant that my fixed fee price to my clients, their cost, needed to allow me to be profitable in doing my projects, to minimally, with my price, exceed my costs to deliver the project. And I wanted to avoid issues where people in the projects weren't clear about you know what was to be done. People might always be suggesting changes that we might add to the project as if that had no consequence. Usually it didn't have any consequence to them. It had consequences to internally to their organization and it, internally to me to decide whether or not I'm going to make a change that seems appropriate um, and do that within the fixed fee pricing I had done or whether I was going to have to then violate my own wish and submit them uh, to them a change order for the changes they were requesting. My approach to this uh, for curriculum architecture projects has been pretty stable and I've not needed to have an alternative approach. But what I've done with my ADDI level MCD, Modular Curriculum Development slash Acquisition, my equivalency to the ADDI kind of an approach to building content, was that if I wasn't able to uh, plan and estimate with great assurity on my part then I would fix fee the project's first three phases and give at the beginning before anything started an estimate for the final three phases. Now my phases for MCD, the first one is project planning and kickoff, followed by phase two analysis, followed by phase three design. I'd always felt that I could reasonably estimate my touch time which then reflects my internal cost for conducting the project, therefore affecting the price to the client, um, that I would need to um, break that down into the first half, fix fee that part, give them a, a reasonable guess, because oftentimes until we do the design, we don't know whether we're talking about two-day course, a three-day course, a four-day course, or a two-day course with a bunch of job aids, performance support items. So I would then, after the design was done and we knew exactly what needed to be built, bought and modified perhaps, or built from scratch, I would f fix fee price the last three phases of MCD, which were development, phase four, phase five is pilot test, and phase six is revision and release and so making the updates post pilot and then releasing that to whatever systems that they had for allowing people to access the content or to go into the delivery mechanisms whatever they might be with my client but so detailed project planning allowed me to fix fee price my projects and many times i would do a preliminary plan on the whiteboard of my in my client's office uh, after having an appropriate amount of discussion which we'll get to in a little bit um, and then I could price out all the touch time per by six phases, per all the outputs uh, that needed to be produced, per all the tasks that were part of all of those outputs. And I could show my clients that here is my time and expense costs. Um, and if you want to, we can do the project plan and proposal using that time and expense cost, but then we don't really know. 
but my alternative is to add 20 percent sometimes 15 percent but usually 20 percent to that fit that time and expense estimate and declare that as the fixed fee price so then all of the risk is on my part and not on theirs and one thing that I've learned over the years is that clients like predictability they want to know what's this really going to cost when all is said and done and the dust has settled you know what are the invoices going to add up to when exactly am I going to have the deliverables um, and so scheduling is affected by your project planning your pricing is affected by your project planning and so project planning is really key and important and I've always been a planner but when I joined Ray Svensson's organization in fall of 1982 November 1st I found that Ray had an approach to project planning that I really liked and while I have modified it just a little bit over the decades it's pretty much Ray Svensson's approach and so I credit everything to him on that so one of the things that I really like that Ray did is he separated the proposal with the price to the client from the project plan so we submitted two documents project plan and a proposal the proposal said here's how much money it's gonna be here's the payment schedule here's the terms and conditions blah 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 all the legalese stuff and my client could then hold that back and not share that with everybody else involved because what they pay for projects is sometimes sensitive and it's not often shared broadly with everybody else who doesn't understand you know what's what's some good instruction cost generally so they they don't know the number might seem high to them uh, or low to them most likely not but high to them and so my clients didn't want to share that and what I'd seen in the past from uh, when I was at Motorola and was working with vendors they would give it to me all in one document but what I liked about what Ray did is he separated out. So here's the project plan. You can share that with every last person in, involved in the project, all the stakeholders, whether they're going to be actively involved or indirectly involved. Um, and therefore, everybody would understand, you know, here's the game plan. Here's what we're going to go do, when we're going to go do it, who's going to do it, how much time we're estimating it's going to take. Either that seems like a reasonable estimate, a guess, or not. And I guess things in terms of the number of days it took. So sometimes it might be 0.5 days or I'd go down to 0.25 days, which is the equivalent of two hours. So I was estimating in a minimum of two hour segments, if you will, um, but at a detailed task level. So let me talk about the project plan right now. So there are eight major sections of the project plan as Ray Svensson taught me to do that and gave me templates which were previous project plans and proposals if he had done it we would just tweak them so eventually I created a generic project plan and proposal that didn't have to be tweaked so much by stripping out things that were about some other client which would be embarrassing if that wasn't caught and then shared with your next client but I would create a generic template um, and the first part of it is the purpose followed by the background then the scope the approach to be taken, project phases and milestones, outputs and deliverables, roles and responsibilities, and the project tasks, roles, and schedules, which was a unique part. That part eight was a unique part of the plan. The rest of it looked like a Word document. This looked more like a spreadsheet, and in fact was. Um, so the purpose is a was as Ray explained it to me back then in 1982 this is a short and sweet one or two paragraphs of you know what what is this all about because executives might not read beyond that and they need to know is this you know hit their wheelhouse appropriately or not is this something that they think is important that they should attend to yes or no would be their answer and so here's where you give them the short and sweet this is what this is all about boom done then the next section provided the background. So why are we doing this and why are we doing it now is how Ray explained it to me and how I've explained it to others in the four decades that I've been using this. Almost four decades. Um, so that background then says, you know, maybe there's a big initiative happening or there's this big issue that we've uncovered or we're redesigning processes and jobs and we need to get a handle on it. And so you need to give the business rationale as to why we might want to do the project which was explained in the purpose statement. But the background gives a little bit more meat on that bone. So a lot of organizations would combine those two things and not think that they're important, but if the background is going to be extensive, you know, you need to write this like a newspaper journalist would have written it, you know, with the, the five W's and the, and the how up in there in the first paragraph and give everything. So if only 
people read the first paragraph they would get the essence of it and if they read further they would go a little bit deeper into the each of the who what why where when and how aspects of the project the next section of this is really important this is the scope and one of the things that I learned over the years is this is just as important to describe what's not a part of the project which what's not in scope but might reasonably be assumed to be in the scope which is always dangerous that assume thing as most of us know um, so what what are we targeting specifically target audiences and their realm of tasks or the processes that this was going to address if we were talking about Addy, we might say okay we're going to go after the instructional developer not the designer not the analyst not the project manager but the developer and we're going to cover their role in the design phase as an observer and in the development phase where they're going to actually be cranking out performance-based content and then they're going to go to pilot test the way I do this um, and they're going to deliver their sections of the pilot test or they're going to observe or they're going to debrief on their sections of the of the pilot test because uh, if it's self-paced people are going to read things and then you know if you wrote the chapter two then you're going to have to debrief people on chapter two so that you bear the brunt of their feedback and get sensitized to okay I don't want to go through that again here I got to work really hard to make sure that this is as good as it possibly can be it may not be perfect but I'll get some feedback but it won't be you know terrible and you can tell the developer that they're going to be doing the development and then they'll be doing the pilot test session and getting the feedback on the portions of the instruction that they authored and that they would be responsible for the in the final phase the sixth phase revision and release they would have to do the revision based on the pilot feedback and the all the data that was generated in the pilot test session um, and so that scoping is really critical to say, you know, who's in the targets in our sites in the box and who's not, who's borderline. So I used to describe target audiences in, in three ways. Primary target audiences, yes, we're going after everything that they need in order to be successful performers. We have a secondary target audience that might get some benefit out of this, but we're not promising to fully meet their needs. If, they, if we meet part of their needs, then that's good but we're not signing up to address all of the needs of a secondary target audience. However, we're cognizant that they exist and that they could take advantage of this, so we'll be mindful of that as we're doing our development and make sure that the examples and definitions and, and descriptions that we use don't make them feel isolated. They can be included in a target audience. But the last target audience, which I call the tertiary target audience, is a declaration that these are a list of the job titles that we're not going to address at all. And when I've had clients ask me, well, you know, why is that necessary? Well, it's been fortunate, my fortune, that later on, when I've been challenged about why we even want to list these tertiary target audience who aren't really a target audience at all, guy, they are the not target audience, I'd have people ask in, project steering team meetings and analysis meetings and design meetings if so-and-so target audiences other job titles were to be included in this because they have some reasonable connection in that person's mind anyway to the scope of what we're addressing and we'd be able to pull out the project plan and say no they're definitely they're on the list of people we're not addressing we really don't care for the purposes of this project uh, what their needs are performance wise what their knowledge and skill needs are from a instructional standpoint um, they're outside the box I mean we can't tackle the whole world here and just let scope creep creep further and further and further away from the primary target audiences so I found it very helpful in the scoping section to say here's who the target is here's people who have some of the needs that overlap with this and here's a list of the groups that and and job titles that we're not going to go after at all we're not going to interview them we're not going to include them in any of our analysis we're not going to do design considering their needs and the performance context that they work within anyway so the next portion is approach and in the approach we would talk about whether we're going to do a traditional approach to this which would be you know a lot of individual interviews observations you know the gemba walk from the quality movement um, or and or document reviews or whether we're going to be using an alternative 
which is my facilitated group process where we're going to assemble a group of master performers, other subject matter experts, supervisors perhaps, and maybe even novice performers. And we're going to facilitate a group process to conduct the analysis that way. And we're going to do the design that way. And when we get into development, we may do development that way but we can be declarative of that. Or we're going to use a combination of the two things and you'd have to read further in the project plan to see well what portions of this are we going to be doing the facilitated group process and where are we going to be doing more of the traditional stuff if this was going to be a blended approach which is sometimes necessary. Um, I've had situations where clients felt uncomfortable that the, uh, the number of people that we were included in our facilitated group process analysis and design was going to be you know eight to twelve people sometimes it went to fifteen to seventeen sometimes up to twenty but that was you know a small sampling size as they had said to me and that they were uncomfortable with you know going to market with a training product uh, that had high stakes high performance uh, was the target based on so little input so I created this convention of not only having an analysis team but an analysis review team and not only having a design team of the master performers, the same people, by the way, who were on the analysis team and no new players because that's just disruptive and creates all sorts of issues. But we might need to have a design review team as well. So we do the analysis maybe in three days with the analysis team and then we take this to different locations. This is what's happened in a couple of instances where we take it to a location. We'd read out all the analysis data uh, maybe a couple of times in a meeting and allow people who had interest to come and listen to what we were doing and what we had captured from an analysis standpoint and then give us their feedback and critique. And go, we would go back and take that back to the project steering team and said, here's what the original analysis group that you handpicked told us and here's what these other people said, some of which we're not too sure about because we don't know that they're in the target audience. You know, If you ask somebody for their opinion, they're likely to give it to you whether or not they have a valid perspective to give you an opinion on in the first place. So we would have to reconcile that and that would slow the project down a little bit and cost more because of the increased touch time. Um, and we'd do the same thing with the design. We'd create a design and before we rushed off to do the development, we'd go run these design review team meetings and make sure everybody understood that this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to configure the content, this is the modulization of the content so you can skip these modules and take the ones that you really need because of your incoming knowledge and skills which is usually a mixed bag across a, a, a target audience. Um, some people know things that, so they should be able to skip things. We shouldn't train people on things that they already know whether we have a test out procedure or it's just the supervisor makes the decision but somehow some way you want to minimize the amount of time spent in training when it's not necessary. Either it's not part of my job or I already know that so why would I take training on that? Unless including people with some knowledge, some expertise are part of the instructional design which is something I've often had to do. But anyway so that we would describe the approach and of course you know we wouldn't go as long as I've just done in explaining all this but uh, um, we need to make that short and sweet so everybody understands this is the me mechanisms that we're going to use to go forward. Group meetings or a bunch of interviews and observations, what are the locations where observations might happen, how are we going to conduct the interviews face to face or over the phone, etc. or virtually. Um, the next section of the project plan is project phases and milestones. Now I have a standard set of those for curriculum architecture design I have four phases. For modular curriculum development and acquisition I have six phases. But if my project is part of a larger initiative and they already have stages or phases or whatever they're using to create milestones for review purposes so that people don't get too far down the road before somebody has a chance to review and approve, modify, or reject what's been produced. So I, I need to modify those things at times. And I might have to include, include my analysis and design phases as one stage in somebody else's project management framework. After all, things like Addy uh, are just a new product development framework for project planning and then project management. 
you know, where are we in the schedule? Are we on time or behind time? You know, that's all based on something that was forecasted earlier, and that's what these project plans do. Then the outputs and the deliverables. So I would want to list per phase each deliverable that the client is going to get so that they would understand, well, I'm going to get these deliverables only during this one phase here. So I might want it earlier, but I'm not going to get it till later. So I'm trying to manage everybody's expectations um, about, you know, when will these deliverables fall out of this effort and how does one lead to the next, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so describing those and providing examples of those is sometimes necessary because my approach to instructional systems design is a little bit different than perhaps many of my clients are used to. And so I can't say, you know, I'm just going to give you an analysis report. I'm going to have to describe, well, there's four portions of that analysis report. There's a target audience analysis. There's a performance analysis. There's a knowledge and skill analysis. And there's an assessment of your existing content so we can decide, is there anything there that we can reuse? So those four outputs, if you will, are encapsulated in an analysis report. But if I just said analysis report, that's not descriptive enough to manage everybody's expectations about what are they going to get and when, and what does that look like, and what information does it contain? Um, what data does it contain that I can extract and make informative? Um, so it's important, I think, to describe the outputs and deliverables and give people a sense as to you know how deep do they go. Um, you know, if you're into what's, what's, what's the design look like, you know, I have three levels to my design. And so people can see, oh, this is where we get it. Okay, well, I can see that last level of design guy is going to be too detailed for any executives of the review. And we can decide that we're going to just show them the two, top two levels or the top one level. Um, but I always have at the ready the details. Um, the next section after outputs and deliverables are roles and responsibilities. So I articulate the the roles as I see them, as I use them, as I configure these projects, I always have a project steering team. It's my client and the other stakeholders, people who have a stake in what we're doing. And also they have the resources that are going to be necessary for us to conduct our project as well as to implement it afterwards. And we need to take those stakeholders on this journey because if you just give them the content at the very end of it and they didn't see anything coming well they didn't understand what the analysis data told us and how it informed the design they didn't see the design before we developed the content and so we really need to make sure that you know they understand their particular role and what their involvement is going to be where is their touch time if you will in the project then there's an analysis team and perhaps an analysis review team and a design team and perhaps a design review team. And there could be a development team. Uh, there can be a pilot test team, of which there are two types of audiences in that. And I want to describe those way up front before we start the project. So that is crystal clear. And I can always point back to that, to that and say, well, we've always said from the very beginning here that when we do the pilot test, we're going to need two types of people in here. Target audience members so we can measure whether or not learning will occur as a result of this training. Two, master performers and perhaps other subject matter experts who can tell us whether or not what was learned, what was taught, was complete, accurate, and appropriate. Um, the learners, the target audience, can't tell us that because they don't know what they don't know. They don't know what they should know, and that's what the training is all about. So we can measure learning with them, but we can't measure learning with master performers. So I would always tell my clients, you know, I know you're going to send in your management spies, as I like to call them. It's an inside joke at some point in the projects. You're going to send in your management spies so they can report back to you the truth. The God's honest truth as to whether or not we produce something good or crap. Technical term. Um, and they like that because they were going to do that anyway. And so here I am open to doing that. And I could tell them exactly the kind of master performers I want. Do I want the master performers in the pilot test sessions to be the same people that were the master performers on the analysis team and design teams and perhaps involved in the development itself? No. They have too much at stake. That's their content as they hopefully look at it. And so I don't want the owners of the content, the authorities that gave the developer the content to be sitting there in judgment and say, well, yeah, that's accurate, complete, and appropriate. I want new master performers, tough, 
people who don't necessarily just love learning and training. I want people who are going to be skeptics and are going to take a critical eye at what we're producing and give us their harsh, honest feedback so that we can skinny things down if we have extraneous content that we didn't realize was extraneous. And we can do all that cleanup after the pilot in the revision and release. So uh, describing the roles and responsibilities is really key and critical so that everybody understands, you know, so what is their role? What are they supposed to do? They're responsible for what? And how much time is it going to take? The timing thing comes in uh, in this next section, the project tasks, roles, and schedule, which I have at some point uh, also described as the task time charts. And the format for this is very different, as you'll see. On the left hand side we identify here are all the project tasks and of course this is all organized within the number of phases of the particular project so uh, here are the tasks for phase one and then phase two here are those tasks but for each of those we have for each task we have the various estimated days required per the two audiences epic incorporated would be me and my team that i've brought in and here's what tasks we're going to perform and how long guy has estimated it's going to take them to do their thing task by task but also on the client side on the customer side what are their touch times what tasks are they involved in by project steering team or analysis team design team etc cetera, etc cetera what the people that the client picks to choose chooses to pick to put into these various teams what's the time burden going to be on them and when is this going to happen schedule wise and so that's the last two columns are the schedule columns when does this begin and when does this end or start and end and so i but i only do the schedule on the things that need to be scheduled because people need to come together for phone interviews or for a face-to-face -face meeting or a virtual meeting to conduct the analysis and or design um, and so I don't schedule every task because I have to provide some flexibility in my organizations in the past any one of the consultants would have been working on four to seven projects at any one time and I need to give some flexibility in terms of how they get some of these uh, less critically scheduled tasks done. I mean, all the tasks are critical, but it, it's, it's required that, you know, you really schedule, hard schedule things so that if you want to have a project steering team get together to review the analysis data, that's got to be on everybody's calendar. It's got to be on everybody's calendar weeks and perhaps months before it actually happens. Because you might look at, okay, we'd like to do this three Fridays from now, can we? No, everybody's, you're all busy, so the next Friday, oh no, uh, the Wednesday before that, yeah, oh yes, we can, so then let's pick that Wednesday. And they might say, well, what about before that third Friday? I go, well, no, I can't, I can't deliver it before then because of the activities, the tasks that my team and your team are performing and the amount of cycle time I need to give people for the touch time that I've estimated. So I got to give a little wiggle room uh, in the timing of everything. So not everything is not back to back to back to back to back. Because if one thing goes wrong here, then the rest of the schedule is toast from there on out. And so you want to be able to recover. Um, and so that's that would be my rationale to the clients when we were explaining all this. But this uh, this task time charts, as I sometimes call them, this is really critical. Um, and if in a project steering team review meeting of the project plan we might quickly go through all the other sections but this is the section of the project plan that I'm gonna drag them through slide by slide like this one example that I'm showing you and I'm going to read <laughs> or paraphrase what that task is and who's involved and look around the room and do face polling to make sure everybody's with me and they understand this is what's going on because some of this is tricky or may not be something that they might normally expect and so I need to draw that out draw their attention to it make sure that they understand it allow them to challenge it or question it um, and if they are really opposed to something then we need to refigure out how we're going to go forward and accomplish that or the entire project if that was necessary um, but anyway, so those are the eight sections of a project plan. 
and uh, as when I was working for Ray, I became the person who was in charge of all the instructional systems design or instructional development kind of work. That was going to be my thing. My two business partners, Ray Svensson and my former wife, Karen Wallace, were involved in other aspects of the business. And sometimes they would be involved in the instructional design projects, but not normally after analysis. They would hand that off. Somebody else would pick up the analysis data create the design, do the development, et cetera, et cetera. They were not involved in those kinds of things. Um, so I had a staff that I was growing to do this kind of work as we got generated more and more business, a lot of repeat business, et cetera. I, just, I wanted to always be able to do fixed fee pricing, but I couldn't always trust my new staff that they could reasonably estimate the time. You know, they, they might be new to my approach to this thing, so they they might have a different view in their head of it until they've been through it a couple of times. But I needed to provide them with some guidance in terms of how to conduct client and stakeholder interviews and bring back to our office all the data that they needed to create a project plan and a proposal. And if they came back with only partial data, then they'd have to go back and redo some of that data gathering and confirmation with certain clients, stakeholder people. Um, and that didn't look good to have to do that. So you wanted to go out there, get it done, get it right the first time, come out with a reasonable project plan, knowing already before you authored that project plan, whether you're gonna go the facilitated group process or the more traditional approach of interviews, observations, and document reviews. Um, be, and unless the client, you know, I've had clients before who said, you know, I want to do the facility group process. I don't think this group is going to buy this. We're going to have to create two versions of the project plan so they can look and decide which way do they want to go. Uh, on the facilitated group process puts a lot of burden on the master performers and subject matter experts. Instead of, instead of spending two hours here and two hours there, they're going to spend three days and three days typically and uh, that may be problematic and they you know the client group who owns the target audience they not may not be willing to give up their master performers for that duration so we may have to go the other route and do interviews and observations and document reviews and so we would do that but so I need so I created this uh, customer stakeholder interview guide as a way to guide it's a job aid performance support in the workflow for my people who are going to be the project planner managers, as I call them, and they may also be the analyst and the designer, but one of their hats that they're going to be wearing is they're going to be the project planner, which means I'm going to saddle them with managing that project plan uh, to the end of the project. So you create the project plan, then you live with it. So you can go through the learning curve and feel the burn and uh, uh, approach it slightly differently the next time, perhaps with your estimate of how long something might take. Um, but I needed them to come back after the the series of interviews, usually it's a series, it's not usually just one client and you're getting information from them, sometimes that happens, but uh, you may be wanting to talk to some of the other stakeholders. And part of this is convincing the client that these stakeholders are key and we probably need to include them in this project steering team so that they understand the project from the very beginning, they understand the business rationale for it, they can voice their concerns, their complaints, their issues with it, their suggestions for how to go forward and do this. They can get on board with us, they can provide us with the right master performers and subject matter experts, etc., that we need to conduct the project regardless of the approach. Um, and that they understand who's in the box and who's not in the box. And because they're going to have to give us people for the pilot test, they're going to have to somehow help us with the implementation of this when we're all said and done and the dust is settled on this particular project. How are you going to deploy this? Uh, you know, how does this factor into the planning? Um, you know, how's the field supposed to treat this? And we need their active involvement and engagement in this thing so that they become part of the owners of what we're producing. I always have tried to make sure that my customers own the project plan, the outputs from all of the phases, um, because they have a huge hand in that when they handpick the people that we're going to be working with 
and either they give us the top tier people and we can produce a top tier product or they give us the bottom of the barrel people and I tell them then we'll produce a piece of crap and we won't know because we don't do this job for a living but we will listen to the wrong people and capture all of that and produce an instructional program and it's all going to be garbage because we talked to the wrong people in the first place and I would actually share that with the project steering team to scare them a little bit about making sure that they gave us the right people you know good input good output garbage input garbage output um, I try to talk in their language anyway so this this interview guide aligns perfectly with the eight sections of the project plan so it asks and poses all the questions to be asked verbatim or uh, uh, as adapted by the consultant who is going to be the project planner to go out and gather all the right data and get the right language and if we want to call them master performers and the client doesn't like that and they want to call them top performers or star performers we can make that note and change everything in our format and content here so we get the language in it that reflects what they like to use what they're familiar with unless I need to make a stand and say you know we're not going to be just going after subject matter experts I don't like subject matter experts. I want to use master performers. I want people who were performing the job at a level of mastery the day before we meet them. I don't need a subject matter expert that used to do the job seven years ago. Um, they're not current. And if we want this content to be current and reflect today's reality, then we're going to need to talk about people who are doing this job at a level of mastery recently. Anyway, so that interview guide. Um, is a, a, a number of pages, nine pages to it, and it will facilitate, guide the performance of the project planner in gathering all the data that they need in order to produce a project plan per the Guy Wallace standard as uh, modified, as adapted from what I learned from Ray Svenson way, way, way back in the day. Um, so another critical aspect about this is that, uh, um, and so I've learned to, I built a little model here. Um, the, uh, this model here says, you know, here are the major tasks. And you can see by the graphic that there's four bubbles, four major bubbles. Uh, three of them are blue. One of them is clear in the middle. And then one in the middle says conduct it. So that's conduct this task. So, but one of the things that I've noticed that wipes projects you know went off schedule is because people didn't didn't really contemplate didn't anticipate and didn't plan for all of the other tasks that surround the primary tasks of conducting you know some activity like run and analysis team meetings so and my clients didn't always understand this so this is where I would get up jump up on their whiteboard and draw a bunch of these kinds of circles and say here's the primary tasks so they would all understand that and then I would go back and draw these other circles well there's a little task of preparing for conducting it there's a another task of coordinating um, the logistics for it because maybe you have to call up and reserve the room and you got to do all that other stuff here preparing for it though is different than coordinating logistics and so I like to segregate those two things out and you know it's a little bit more detail one extra level if you will one extra task mini task if you will but that's got to be recognized now in my world in the past when I had a staff I would have my production support people the the home office team if you will do the coordination of the logistics because I didn't need my higher priced uh, expensive consultants doing that kind of work but they needed to prepare for running the meeting but they didn't need to make sure that there was going to be you know the right projector the screens the flip chart easels the paper and pens the refreshments the coffee the donuts and all of that I could have somebody else do that and so this was my way to divide and conquer all of these tasks and reduce my cost by giving it to the lowest cost person that I could in my system and that would be reflected in my lower price to my clients um, and after the conduct bubble you'll notice there's a document so you could run a three-day meeting and then think well, okay that was three days and then we're off to doing the next thing you know three-day analysis meeting then we're going to do design well wait but no we're going to do a lot of documentation of that three-day meeting and that doesn't come for free 
and that's not done in just a minute or two. That might take a couple of days to actually document and refine and clean up what you, were, what you captured before you're ready to get ready for the next step, which in my case is usually more analysis or more design, and then a project steering team gate review meeting. And then once we go through that gate review meeting, running that gauntlet, if you will, then we're ready for the next phase. Um, so the this little bubble diagram here um, helps me identify those micro tasks, help me identify the cycle time necessary to accommodate all the touch times. So if I'm going to have one person do all of this, they're going to prepare for it, and then they're going to coordinate the logistics, and then they're going to conduct the task, and then they're going to document it. What are the amounts of times for all of that? And if that all added up to four and a half days, do I allow just four and a half days in my cycle time, in my schedule for my project for that to happen? Or do I give six days for those four and a half days to occur in? And so those are judgment calls that project planners, new project planners especially, struggle with. You know, how much wiggle room do I need to give in here? And some people would, you know, put a, a, a week in between when, you know, maybe a day would be all that was really needed. Um, but that's part of the learning curve for people who are doing project planning um, and then managing the projects to their plan. Um, but so this was important and I've, I did a video uh, of my 2009 ISPI presentation on this. I'm not sure it's a very good video, but it goes through examples of how I can take my standard six phase approach and break it down into exactly how many of these bubble sets, if you will, will there be? Because I've already figured all that out. Um, if I know that I'm going to have four types of analysis for my analysis phase, well, I've got four of those bubbles, one to do the target audience analysis, another one to do the performance analysis, although the knowledge and skill analysis is done within that, so I can combine those two. And then there's the assessing the existing training, which is another one. Then there's prefer preparing for and conducting the project steering team gate review meeting, and then boom, we're into the next phase. But anyway, so that's how this works. And I created this little mechanism here to help train my own people. And then I've trained my clients. Uh, I've had a number of clients who I've trained in uh, my instructional systems design methodologies, CAD and MCD. And I've trained people to be project planners and managers. And I've trained people to be analysts. And I've trained people to be designers at the CAD level and then designers at the MCD level, because those are two different approaches to design and yes one person could be able to learn how to do both but uh, um, as I groomed and developed people I usually take people from being developers to being MCD designers to being CAD designers to being analysts to being project planners and that's how I groomed and grew my own staff so that I could offload some of the burden from me so that I wouldn't have to be the person who did all of the project planning and I owned all the projects and I have to oversee the projects. I had, I really had to disperse those roles and responsibilities to more and more of my staff as my business volume grew. Um, and also some of my staff, uh, they had lower daily rates and so my clients, you know, sometimes they wanted me to do it all and that's fine. But I could say, here's the parts where I'm going to play a role and here's where I'm going to give the, the tasks to others on my staff who might be half of my daily rate and therefore I'm saving the client money and then they could look at okay who when is somebody else other than guy gonna be doing these things and I okay with that okay that doesn't look like it's that critical looks like guys in more critical spots and then once they got to know some of my staff they would be more accepting of me stepping out of the projects entirely and letting my staff take the, those things over which you know is the is the mark of success when your clients are willing to take somebody other than you who they've grown accustomed to and start uh, embracing other people doing this whose personality and styles at doing all of this might be very different looking on the surface but underneath it all they still they produce the same kinds of outputs and deliverables um, so you can, if you're interested in, you can read uh, more about this project planning and management approaches. Um, I've uh, 
I've got in chapter 28 of my 1999 book, Lean ISD, I cover all of this. Lean ISD is available as a free 410 page PDF. You can also get it as a Kindle or as a paperback. Um, and then there's two other books from 2011 that detail this. And the one book is on my performance based curriculum architecture design. And the second book is on performance based modular curriculum development, my two major methodologies. In 2008, I did a blog post about all of this uh, with reference to the interview guide and examples from some of the pages of, a, uh, of the interview guide, the notes that I might have taken. I think I made it all up. I don't think it's from a real project. Um, in 2009, I had that ISPI presentation, and so that's available on YouTube. And I have another blog pro post from 2012 where I went into some detail of it. Um, so project planning at a detail level, again, I feel is extremely critical. I fully appreciate that not all of my clients want to be dragged through all the stinking details, as we might refer to them. Um, and I can, uh, so when I, when I do these project plans and I do my reviews, particularly in the project steering team gate review meetings, I can show my clients a high level view of the projects and the flow of the activities, if you will. And then I can dive, go deeper with what, everything that's in my project plan. Um, and that's helpful. Sometimes the clients just want to know, hear a few words about, you know, the, the phase one and phase two and phase three, four, five, and six. And they don't want to go into a lot of details. And I've been told, warned by my primary client, that the rest of the stakeholders aren't going to tolerate being dragged through this. So let's just keep it at a high level. So I walk in and do it at that and somebody has a detailed question about something that's going to happen in analysis and they want to know how you're really going to conduct this. Well then I can go deeper because I have my detailed project plan at the ready and I can hand it out to them if I didn't hand it out to them before, usually because the client didn't want to, they're being trying to be very sensitive to people's time and not overwhelming them with all the stinking details. Um, but there are people who are concerned with the stinking details and if you are truly a stakeholder and this target audience that we intend to address and the scope that we're going after is of importance to you as a stakeholder, then you might want to do a deeper dive into how we're going to go about doing this. You may want to test that out to, to be satisfied yourself that this makes sense and that this is going to produce good stuff and not garbage. Anyway, that's it for this edition of Adventures in Performance-Based Training with your host, me, Guy Wallace. And the subtitle for this series is also known as The Insomnia Solution, but not for my insomnia, but for yours. Just kidding. Have a good day. Cheers.